Church, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 3. This is Luke's second volume. His first volume was the Gospel of Luke. His second volume is the book of Acts, where he writes about the life of the first Christians, the early church. Listen to a longer reading this morning. I needed to read a little bit more for us to understand the fullness of the story. Yeah, that's, that didn't fix it. Um, Acts chapter 3, 1 through 19. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a, crippled, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate, known as the beautiful gate, so he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When, Peter and John, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I don't have any money, but what I give you, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. At once his feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprised at what had happened to him. While the healed man clung to Peter and John, all the people rushed toward them at Solomon's porch, completely amazed. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power and piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. You rejected the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. His name itself has made this man strong. That is, because of faith in Jesus' name, God has strengthened this man whom you see, see and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete health right before your eyes. Brothers and sisters, I know you acted in ignorance. So did your rulers. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I don't think I'm going too far on a, on a limb to venture that most of us in this room know how to ride a bike, or at least did at one point. I don't know that you ever forget how to ride a bike. Whether or not your body forgets is a different story, but uh, most of us know how to ride a bike, and next week, this weekend, is it Saturday, is the Barry Robe, which is some of us here are doing it, and you're crazy, but good for you. Um... It's uh, like the world's lar lar the world or America's largest off-road bike race, and thousands of people are going to flood downtown Hastings for the Barry Row Bay. It's a, quite an exciting event. Um, so maybe for those who are bikers in the room, can you could you please articulate for me, explain to me in detail how you know that you know how to ride a bike? How can you put into words that? How do you explain? to someone, this is how you stay up on a bike. This is how you ride a bike. Maybe you can get into some science about it. there's inertia, there's momentum, but it's hard to like articulate balance. Surely there's a knowledge that is required to ride a bike, right? I mean, but the question is, how are we to articulate or explain or describe that knowledge? How do you put it into words? I mean, when you learn to ride a bike, you just kind of sense it. It's kind of this, you get the sense that, okay, I'm feeling in balance here. Uh, there's, your body kind of communicates to you, but it's hard to explain or teach that. I mean, you just kind of push the kid down a hill on a bike and they'll figure it out, right? That's what, that's what you do, right? No, what you do is you start with the bikes without the pedals and let them just kick and then they figure out balance. I would also venture to guess that we often know that know when we're in a room that we're not welcome in. You know what I'm talking about? You know when you're not welcome in a place. Freeze out. You, maybe you can't 
put into words why. Maybe it's hard to articulate what it is about that space. Hastings is a former sundown town, a place where persons of color knew they were not welcome at night. It wasn't necessarily put into the legal description of the town, but when persons of color came to town in the mid-20th century, you just kind of knew. You just got the sense that like, oh, I might not be welcome here. People talk about vibes today, right? Well, the vibe is off. It can be hard to put it into words, but sometimes we just know when things feel a little bit off, don't we? We just get this sense, ooh, my spidey senses are tingling. It's not that anyone has done anything egregious or heinous even necessarily. It's not that we could say like, well, you slighted me, and so I know I'm not welcome here. It's just kind of this sense we can get, oh, ah, something's off here. These difficult-to-articulate forms of knowledge have a term. There's a word for this. 20th century chemist turned philosopher, uh, uh, a Jew who escaped uh, Nazism in the early 20th century, who became a philosopher, Michael Polanyi, which is a really fun name to say, Polish philosopher Polanyi. He coined a term for this type of knowledge, and he called it tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge. Being tacit means that it can be understood without being expressed. You know it's true, even if you can't put it into words. He argued that we can know things without being able to articulate it so clearly and so succinctly, and that our articulation of a thing does not determine how much we know it. Just because you might not be able to explain it doesn't mean you don't know it. Knowledge is tacit, he argued. It doesn't need explanation in order to be true. It doesn't need to be seen or heard or perceived for it to be true. We can know it's true without some of the very clearly defined tangible evidence of it. It's tacit. And as I read from Acts chapter 3 this morning, I sometimes wonder what the real miracle is in the story. I mean, there's obviously a miracle here, right? But I wonder, what's the, what's the genesis of this miracle? Peter and John are going to the temple, which is... What, just what Jews did. Remember, Peter and John are still very Jewish. Even though uh, this is after the resurrection and this is after the ascension of Jesus, they are still thoroughly Jewish. They're going to the temple at three in the afternoon because that's just what you do. And as they make their way into the temple, they heard the voice of a man whom they had probably heard before. They probably recognized this voice they're going to the temple through the gate called Beautiful when the most likely very familiar voice rings out asking for a few coins. His friends placed him there every day, and as they go to the temple every day to pray, it's likely that they knew this man. So, yes, there's this, this healing where his feet and legs grow strength, but I don't know, perhaps the most miraculous part of the story is not that the man who has been been unable to walk since birth gains the ability to walk. I don't want to diminish that, but I don't know. What if one of the more miraculous parts of the story is what we read early on in the passage, that Peter sees him? But it's not just that Peter sees him. Do you know what Peter said to this man? Do you recall what Peter said to this man as he was walking in the beautiful gate? He said to him, look at us. Peter said to this man, look at us. Peter sees him, and he tells him to see them. Lift up your eyes, brother. Look at us. Money I don't have, but what I do have, I will give to you. Why does Peter tell him to look at them? I mean, couldn't he have just done what he wanted to do without having him look up at him? Well, apparently, this man knew tacitly that he should not make eye contact with those entering the temple. He was at the beautiful gate every day outside of the temple. Nobody had to tell him the right posture to take. He just knew tacitly, well, I keep my head down and I ask for coins. And every once in a while, one out of every 15 people will drop a denarii into my bowl. Peter sees this man. He sees him and he says to him, look at 
us. What he's doing is he's, he's seeing this man not as a pariah, not as one milking off of the system, not as one who isn't adding anything to society. No, Peter sees him as one made in the image of God. Look at us. There's a mutuality taking place here. There is a power shift taking place. Rather than Peter and John being the ones looking at him, he says to this man, no, 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 no. Look at us. You look at us as well. There's a leveling here. And I have to wonder how it is Peter was able to say this to this man. Maybe Peter could talk to this man and could could be the agent of this healing because of a previous interaction he'd had when Jesus was still around. This is a man who was born without the ability to walk, but maybe you recall another story of a man who was born without the ability to see. There was a man who was born blind. Do you remember that story? Do you remember what the disciples asked of Jesus, of this other one who was outside of the temple? Who, what, did they, what did they ask Jesus? Who sinned? that this man was born without the ability to see. Who, whose transgression was it? Was it his parents or was it his, his own? The implication being, if he, had been, been, if he had lost his sight later in life, well, then we could clearly say, well, it was his own sin that caused his blindness. But because he was born blind, well, was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? tacitly affirming that sin leads to disability. That is what is assumed in that interaction. Well, obviously, he wouldn't be disabled if he hadn't had some form of sin in his life. Jesus said that he was not born blind because he or his parents were sinners, but because God's glory was going to be revealed through him. Because apparently even a disability will not prohibit the glory of God from being displayed. Because this was the prevailing thought at the time. At at the second temple period of, of Jewish theology, the thought at the time was that people born with disabilities or people who became disabled, this happened because of sin. Not not to say that there is sin in the world, so so we are not... Uh, fully as we will be in our resurrected state. That's not what they were saying. What they were saying was, you transgressed, therefore you have a disability. Maybe if you hadn't been such a sinner, you wouldn't be so disabled. They were unclean. They were unworthy. Where is this man sitting? Outside of the gate called beautiful. Implied is, where is he not sitting, church? Peter's posture towards him shows him that he is worthy. Look at us. You have something to give here. All right? Everyone is astonished by what they think is Peter's ability to tell this man that he should stand up and walk. By his ability to, by their, under, by what they perceive to be his ability to heal this man. You know what Peter does in this moment? There's a little bit of shift in the story here. Peter says, here's my opportunity. Here is my chance. They can't believe what they have seen. The text says multiple times that they were amazed. Did you catch that? Two or three times it says they were amazed. And Peter knows that he now has an in. He has a window. He has an opportunity. I almost titled the sermon Real Life Proclamation because of the emphasis placed on Peter's sermon here. But at the beginning of of Acts, we hear sermon after sermon from Peter. He's constantly sharing the good news of the resurrection. It's like, it's like he's always looking for a window. It's like he's always wondering, where's the opportunity to talk about the resurrection? He hears the astonishment of his fellow Jews, these Israelites, and he, he just can't not share about the resurrection. You think that I did that? <laughs> Ooh, you think that we could accomplish that? Peter and John, you think we could do that? No, 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 no. Let me tell you who it was. This was Jesus. And I'm struck struck by this. Yes, the the proclamation, but also Peter's, Peter's posture to find 
an opportunity to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. There's a window here that I don't know that we all would see. He then goes into this long sermon. How often are we looking for the opportunity to share the good news? Maybe in word, I hope in word, but also in deed. Because Peter's posture here is not just what he says, but it's how he interacts. Surely there are opportunities for us, right? Surely we all have windows to point others to the resurrection. Surely the resurrection power of Christ is still at work in our world today. And I hope we have eyes to see it. But Peter hears this astonishment and says, oh, you all need to know this was Jesus. Where is that happening in our world where the, the resurrection power of work is, is on display in our life and we say, oh, 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 y'all need to know that was Jesus, right? Right there. Do you catch that? That was Jesus. Where is Jesus in your life? Or more pointedly, maybe, where is the resurrection of Jesus on display in your life? And maybe another question is, who are those who need to hear just how good the good news is? Notice who he's talking to, by the way. He's not talking to those outside of the temple. He's talking to those inside the temple. Some of us need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe, maybe what's, what's really, really challenging about this text is how Peter addresses those he's sharing the good news with. I mean, did you, did you hear what he said to these people? Brother is not pulling punches. He is not pulling punches when he talks to them. What does he say to them? Hey, guys, we didn't do this. We did not heal this man. We did not strengthen his leg. It was Jesus who did it. Jesus, you know, the guy that you put on a cross? Whew. He's not pulling any punches here. The guy that you and your leaders killed, that's the guy. I didn't do this. John and I didn't do this. The one that God resurrected from the dead did this. Y'all killed him. God raised him. That's the one. And then he, he says something to this crowd who has gathered in astonishment at the temple for worship. Interestingly, he does not say it to the man who was born without the ability to walk. He says something to the religious folk, to the faithful folk. He says this to them. Y'all put Jesus to death. And at the end, of the end of the reading this morning, he says, now change your hearts and lives so that your sin may be forgiven. Peter says that there are a certain people who need to repent. And he doesn't say it to the one outside the temple. He says repentance is for those very ones in the temple. Notably, he does not tell the man who was presumed to be sinful because of his disability that he needed to repent of his sin. He does not tell this one who's outside the temple who is apparently sinful according to the theological posture of the time that he needs to repent of his sin. No, he says to those who, who are inside the temple, you all need to repent. You change your hearts and lives. You know, we saw something similar happen at another point in the Gospel of John, early on in the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, a man named, named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a Pharisee, a teacher of the law. What did he say? to? Do you remember John 3? We know John 3, right? It's one of the most well-known chapters in the Bible. What does he tell Nicodemus, a religious leader? What does he tell him? You need to be born again. Born from above. You need new birth, he says to the religious elite. This would be like me going to the district superintendent of the Michigan District Church of the Nazarene and telling him, hey, you need to be born again, brother. This would be like me going to a general superintendent, a leader of the denomination, and saying, sister, you need to repent. Change your life. He's telling a teacher of the law, repent, be born again. But what's so fascinating is that juxtaposed in the very next chapter, Jesus is met by a woman at a well. He tells this religious leader, the one who was in charge of the religious establishment, you need to be born again. Then he meets this woman who 
has had a rather sordid history. This woman who has apparently had five husbands and is living with one who is not her husband, he does, interestingly enough, he meets her not with a posture of, you need to be born again. He meets her instead with a posture of, if you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink from the well, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. He meets her not with a criticism or a condemnation, but he meets her with compassion, with belonging, with welcome, with hospitality. He says, hey, if you knew who I was, you would come to me and I would create life for you. There's this weird thing that happens in the Bible where those who think they are righteous are the ones who need to repent the most. Those who think they have things figured out are the ones who need to change their hearts and lives. While those who know they are sinners need welcome and belonging and hospitality. You see, as I wrap up this message, it's worth addressing one last question, because he says to these religious folk, y'all need to change your hearts and lives. What is it that needs to change? What is it about their hearts and lives that needs to be changed? To put it another way, why would these religious folk need to repent? I mean, how can you say to a bunch of sanctified Nazarenes, y'all need to repent? I mean, if we've been sanctified, what repentance is needed, amen? I, I was sanctified 25 years ago. I haven't since then, so why do I need to repent? He says to the religious, y'all need to repent. What is it about their lives that needs to change? I mean, sure, putting Jesus on the cross, that's obviously there, right? Or maybe a better way of putting it is being complacent while those who were in charge put Jesus on the cross. Being idly standing by watching this innocent one be crucified. You better believe it. But I'm struck by the the composition of the story in Acts chapter 3. It's so interesting that the sermon of Peter is right on the heels of the healing of this man. That the, the sermon that Peter says to the religious leaders about, the faithful ones about needing to repent, is, is, is right on the heels of the strengthening of this man's heels outside the temple. Pete, perhaps the composition of the story is really important. Maybe this is an important arrangement of the story that this interaction takes place because of what happened. Because remember, according to the prevailing theology of the time, people would have thought that this man was a sinner, deserving in some way of, the, of punishment, of divine punishment that warranted a disability. Jesus had revealed to Peter that that's not the case, that that's really bad theology. But what we see is that he was apparently not permitted in the temple. His friends brought him to the temple every day and placed him where? You can sit out out there, brother. People will walk by. You can hang out back there. He was apparently not permitted in the temple. Now, we don't know. Scholars are kind of up in the air about whether or not this was a formal practice or if it was just something that was done because that's what was done. Apparently, he knew that he should not make eye contact with those righteous folks who are walking in the temple. Otherwise, why would Peter say, look at us? This person with a, debil- with a disability had his dignity, his agency, his worth, and the very image of God overlooked daily by the religious folk going in to praise their Lord. He had his, his, the divine stamp upon his life overlooked as he was prohibited from entering into the place of worship because of his perceived sin. Church, there is strong gatekeeping taking place here. There's a big gate here. And this one who was walked to the temple, placed there every day, was placed just far enough away. That's some strong gatekeeping. And perhaps... That is an offense worthy of repentance, according to Peter. Perhaps keeping people out because they're unclean, keeping people out because they're not like us, keeping people out because they are sinners, 
is something for which people ought to repent. Peter's message implies that if they had believed Jesus, if they had taken Jesus' message seriously, if they knew who this Jesus really was, they would not overlook this man. They would not look, overlook this one. Notice, if you will, that Peter makes it a point to refer to Jesus with a title that he is not often referred to in the New Testament. Peter says, this one, this Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus, the Nazarene. You know what he's saying there? He's saying this Jesus was an overlooked one. He was from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? He was one on the outs. Jesus, the Nazarene. You know that's why our denomination is called what it is. Because Jesus was a marginalized one. Jesus was a forgotten one. Jesus was the Nazarene. And Peter here says about this In in the context of this one who had been overlooked, he says, Jesus the Nazarene that you killed. Jesus the overlooked one. Jesus the forgotten one. Jesus the one from the wrong side of the tracks. Jesus is one that you wouldn't have made eye contact with either. For he was a Nazarene. You see, the good news is that even this one was welcomed into the community. You know, you know what happened? He went in the, in the temple and was praising and worshiping God. He was welcomed into the community, community, not only when he was healed, church. His healing was the byproduct of Peter and John looking at him and saying to him, look at us. You see, becoming a part of the community was a part of his healing not the other way around. The prevailing thought at the time was, well, if you're made well, then you can become a part of us. If you look like us, then you can become a part of us. If you are like us, then you can become a part of our worshiping body. And Peter says, y'all need to repent of that. And displays that, no, come be a part of us, and then God will do a good thing through you because you are a part of us. What was the thing they needed to repent of? They needed to repent of the posture which made people that were socially deemed sinners unwelcome. Y'all don't belong here. You can sit outside the gate. They made it so that he was not welcomed in their assembly. Now, here's the thing, church. We don't see that stated explicitly in the text, do we? The the dismissal of this one is not laid out so explicitly, but it's a little bit more tacit. He just knows he doesn't belong. There are signs, there are markers. He didn't need to be able to articulate it or explain it for it to be true. Because when Peter tells him to look at us, we see his posture. We see what he knows to be true already. He has learned tacitly that he's not welcome that he doesn't belong, that he is lesser. And the folks in Jerusalem have have a shared expression towards these persons with disabilities. Their posture, their disposition is tacitly communicating that people aren't welcome. They don't need to be explicit. This man is tacitly aware of his place in that society. And here's the thing, the folks going up to temple to pray could have even said something like, well, we didn't exclude him, right? They could have said, well, I mean, I carried him to the temple every day. I gave him a few denarii every once in a while. How was I mean? I wasn't mean to him. They could have said, I didn't, I don't know why he doesn't feel like he's not welcome. He's here. I didn't do anything egregious, but this man knew. He knew. Look at his posture. He knew what Michael Polanyi would articulate almost 2,000 years in the year 1966. That you, that you can know things to be true even if it's not explicit and even if you can't put it into words. You know it's true. He knew tacitly that he wasn't welcome because of the posture of those going up to worship. 
their posture towards him communicated in hospitality. You see, a posture of hospitality is about way more than just saying hello. And church, that's the bare minimum of hospitality. I hope you know. Saying hello to somebody you don't know is the bare minimum. As an aside, I heard uh, uh, one of those leader thinkers talk about how to be successful in life. Do you know what he said one of the, was one of the most important things to do in his life? Say hi to five people he didn't know every day. Anyway. A posture of hospitality is about way more than just saying hello or shaking a hand. Hospitality is a disposition. It's the way you look at people. And it's also the way you invite them to look at you. Look at us, Peter says. It's a posture. It's a way that we carry ourselves. That lets people know whether there's a place for them or not in a way that they might never even be able to describe it. They can say, ah, it, it, I don't know, it just felt off. The vibe was wrong. That's tacit knowledge. Or they might say, oh man, that just felt right. It, I, oh, I don't know how to put it into words. It just felt right. Which begs the question, church, if even the faithful need to change their hearts and minds, according to St. Peter, well, then maybe even we need to be willing to have our own hearts and our own, my own lives changed because of the beauty and the power of the resurrection. I mean, nothing is the same because of the resurrection. It's changed everything. Could it be that even we today need to repent? That, that if even the faithful need to repent, and, and if they need to repent because of a posture that prohibited this man from joining their assembly, then maybe we need to ask ourselves, who are those who might not be welcomed into our assembly? Who are those that we might say, well, we can get together outside, or we can, we can see each other out there, but y'all aren't welcome here. What does a welcoming posture actually look like in the year of our Lord 2024? Because I don't know that these folks who needed to repent ever actually said to the man who couldn't walk that he wasn't welcome. I don't know they, they, that they were explicit about it, but he knew. They didn't need to say it. It wasn't explicit. It was a posture. It was the way they looked at him. What church is our posture? Are there any that would feel like they would not be welcomed or could not belong or would be prohibited from our assembly? Well, hear the good news, church. Hear the good news. If you are one of those who feels alone or marginalized or like there's not a place for you, I hope that you know that according to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has made a place for you. But hear this as well, church. If we assume a posture that communicates to others that they are not welcome, well, maybe some resurrection repentance is needed. If the way that we carry ourselves and conduct ourselves communicates to others tacitly that they don't belong, well, then we might be in need of, of some resurrection repentance just like those some 2,000 years ago. Because real life in the resurrection of Jesus looks like seeing the image of God in others seeing their dignity, their value, their worth. You know, we, we talk about, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. What if we don't need to hate the sin? I don't know. What if that's not our prerogative? What if the responsibility to take care of sin is on the one who conquered sin and death in the resurrection? What if instead our posture is you are one who was born in the image of God, made in his likeness, you are worthy of love and belonging, and the resurrection of Jesus tells me that. Real life in the resurrection of Jesus looks like seeing the image of God in others, their dignity, their value, their worth, regardless of whatever status of sinner they may hold. Because real life in the resurrection of Jesus is found when we are willing to change our hearts, and our lives in order to see his beauty in other people. And church, that's the good news of the resurrection for us today. 